So today's message is going to be built on a simple uh, premise found in Hosea 4, 6, which says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, or as the message paraphrase puts it, my people are ruined because they don't know what is right or true. So today, my job as your pastor is to share with you what I believe to be spiritual, scriptural truth, and then I'm going to leave the results into God's hands, that when you hear the things that I'm about to share on the topic that we're going to talk about, it's between you and God. May he convict us, may he change us, may he mold us, may he make us where that is necessary. I'm going to speak to you about the topic of, should Christians celebrate Halloween? Should Christians celebrate Halloween? I'm going to talk to you about it from a personal perspective, from a cultural perspective, from a historical perspective, and then from a scriptural perspective. Now, personal experience um, says something, but it doesn't say a whole lot, right? How many of you ever been deceived by your own emotions? Anybody here? See, so we can be deceived by our own emotions. It carries some weight. Personal testimony is important. Now, historical evidence is important, right? We can study the past. We can learn from it. We can learn about the origins of a thing, and it may influence the way we think about it. So historical stuff has some value. Now, culture can mess you up big time. Culture can mess you up. The whole world is trying to lead us in one direction that is away from Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful of what the crowd is doing at times. We need to focus on what Scripture says as our final point. Scripture should carry the most weight on any topic that we study. So today we're going to do that. We're going to dive into this subject, should a Christian celebrate Halloween? So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are here to worship you, to exalt the name of Jesus, to lift you on high. We're here to shed light of the Holy Spirit on a subject that has darkness surrounding it. Would you use it to illuminate this subject in our hearts and our minds? And if any hearts and minds need to be changed as a result of what is said, Lord, would you do that changing? Would our hearts not harden as a result of what we hear, but would our hearts be softened to what you speak to each of us today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus Christ? Amen and amen. So today I'm going to talk about this subject, should Christians celebrate Halloween? I'm going to state my position right from the get-go. I have a bulletproof vest on. It is absolutely okay. Um, I believe that Christians should not participate in Halloween in any way. And I'm going to make my case to that. If you disagree with me, I hope that we can still be friends afterwards, that we can still love one another and care for one another and fellowship with one another, but just disagree on this particular subject. I think it's an important one. I don't want anybody to be deceived by the origins of this holiday or what it represents. And may the Lord touch each of our hearts with regards to this subject so that we can come up with the conclusion that he would have us. So am I safe here? Does our IRT team got my back today? You guys, you guys watching me? Personal. So let's start there. He talked about personal experience. So um, I didn't always believe this way. I didn't always think that Halloween was a bad thing. Um, in fact, in our early days, Mary Jo and I met when we were 17 and one of the first holidays, so to speak, that we celebrated together during our senior year was Halloween. I could remember the day distinctly, although uh, probably in a drunken, drug-induced haze, sadly, at that particular stage of my life, we celebrated Halloween as young kids, and there was nothing apparently or inherently wrong with it in our minds as unbelievers. In fact, I was, uh, that, that same year, I actually worked at a haunted house. I worked at a haunted house. It was led by Christians. Go figure. It was kind of strange, but a group much like Young Life Today was leading a haunted house down there in Miami, and I helped be a part of that. Sadly, again, my drug addiction was already starting to take root in my life. I remember sneaking bottles of alcohol and going there and drinking and sneaking out to the car to drink. These are my memories of what Halloween represented and was all about back in the day. It was another time to party. It was another time to hang around friends. It was a time that sometimes caused us trouble. It I get in a little bit of trouble on days like that, but I didn't think there was anything necessarily or inherently wrong with it. So what changed? What began to change? Well, we, be, we received a lot of information, much of which I'm going to share with you today from scripture, from history, and it made us do a radical about face. 
Now, anybody who's been around here any length of time knows Mary Jo loves to decorate, right? She loves to decorate. She knows how to do it up. She really enjoys that kind of thing. So when we were still out there and unsaved, you can imagine what our house looked like. I mean, you thought it got taken over by a Halloween monster. I mean, blah, the whole thing, the whole house was there. She would do, she just did it up like she did every other holiday. And um, in fact, she's very good at making costumes and things of that nature. She was so good at it that she was actually selling the costumes that she was making. Other people were buying the costumes that we had on our kids. So it was a source of income for her. And then we ended up learning about this information that changed our position the day before Halloween. So I've tried to give you guys a couple weeks lead time in Jesus name. I've tried to help you out here the day before. So we at that time had two children, I think at that, that, that particular date. And Matthew was four or five years old at that time. So for Matthew, we had to go explain to a little four or five year old why we're not celebrating Halloween. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth that particular evening, right? So Mary Jo goes through Halloween Eve and takes everything out of the house. I mean, anything related to Halloween, gone, garbage, just out of there. So we did a radical about face on this particular subject in our life. So I would begin even now to offer up some cautions via scripture. Um, You might begin to think, yeah, but when I do Halloween, it's all good stuff. I dress my child up as an angel, and and maybe we thought that too. We're going to dress up. Somebody was an angel when they were a kid. I see that right there. Come on. You know, our first Matthew was dressed like a pumpkin, I think, for his first time that he was there, right? Um, But here's the deceptive thing. Here's the danger in even perceiving it to be a good thing. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Something doesn't have to seem evil or just be evil because the devil's a deceiver and he's a liar. It says in verse 14, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So you can expound on this well beyond the subject of Halloween. The devil is a liar. The devil seeks to deceive. The devil seeks to sow seeds of destruction into our life. Um, He doesn't need everybody to be an out there blatant Satan worshiper, right? I don't know any out there blatant Satan worshipers, do you? I've not met any, I met a few through my years, but I mean, they're not showing up in church, you know what I'm saying? But there's not a whole bunch of them. His job is not necessarily to have you out there be an outright blatant Satan worshiper. His job is to keep you this far from the truth. If he can keep you that far from the truth, he could keep you from ever knowing the truth and becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. Or if you are a believer, he can make you very ineffectual in your faith. He'll make you impotent. He'll make it where you can't perform in your faith in Jesus' name. So we had a young child, and we did this radical about face. What happened in our hearts? Let's begin to look at the historical roots of Halloween. What is this holiday that we celebrate all about? It was started by the Celtic Druids from Western Europe and the Scottish-Irish area of Europe that we would call the Scotland or Ireland today. It was in that particular region. What were these people doing and what were they known for? The Druids were known for their occultic practices. They were known for their magic. They were known for their spells. But most importantly, they were known for their frequent and barbaric human sacrifices. This is what distinguished them as a people. This is what they were known for. When people talked about them, those are the people that sacrifice their children. Those are the people who kill other people and sacrifice human beings. This is what they're known for. And this was their high holiday. This was the day where, in effect, they worshiped Satan, but they called him Sanhian, and they worshiped him that day. This is the high holy day of Satan. So on October 31st, it was celebrated by the Druids with many human sacrifices and a festival honoring their sun god, Samhain, the lord of the dead. They believed that sinful souls who died during the year were in a place of torment and would be released only if Sam hand was pleased with their sacrifices. So this holiday, so to speak, started out as a day to worship the devil through human sacrifice. Not a good start, right? Not a good start, right? So let's look at some of the objects and history surrounding that particular day and see if they line up with the Christian faith. Um, Many of us celebrate Halloween or have by the use of jack-o'-lanterns, right? How many of you had a jack-o'-lantern? You're not willing to raise, at some point in your life, you had a jack-o'-lantern. Raise your hand right now, right? So some of you got it on your front porch right now. He's like, oh no, what is he going to say? 
So jack-o'-lanterns, seems innocuous, right? I mean, they even have stuff now where you could go carve it to look like Donald Trump. I mean, they got the little thing, you can put Donald Trump on your jack-o'-lantern. But what's the origins? What is the purpose behind them? And knowingly or unknowingly, if you participate in that, what are you actually reinforcing? What are you doing in your life? That cute little old jack-o'-lantern, right? They were first used by the Druids as part of their human sacrifices. After they killed their victims, they drained the fat from their body and filled the gourd or pumpkin with it and put a candle or wick inside. A sinister face was carved on the outside of the face of the pumpkin and the wick was lit, burning the fat as fuel, fat lighter, right? This was done to appease their gods, the dark spirits, Satan. Think about that. Yet we as Christians, under normal circumstances, we wouldn't go grab something like that and put it out there on our porch knowing the origins of such a thing, right? Here's the analogy I would give you. So on Halloween, we'll do some really weird stuff. We'll go out there to Walmart and we'll buy like a serving set that'll go, oh, it'll be a skull. That's the bowl that you put the stuff in and you pour the Kool-Aid into the bowl, right? So you pour the Kool-Aid, so you're drinking blood out of the skull. And then you go and you get skull shaped glasses and you throw a party and everybody goes and you drink out of that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with it on Halloween, right? Now, if I brought that to your house in February, you'd think I'm straight crazy, would you not? (laughs) You'd be like, what the heck is this guy doing? You'd think I'm nuts. Yet we violate our own conscience. We do weird stuff. We decorate our house and put all kinds of dead things out there. What do you think a little kid thinks when they walk up into the toy section of Walmart and the workers there dressed like a demon, so to speak, when they walk up? Did it put some thoughts in their mind like, what in the heck is this? Sadly, very early on, Christians attempted to appease the Druids rather than confront the issue. Pope Gregory III moved a church festival from October 31st to November 1st and called it All Hallows or All Saints Day. Pope Gregory IV decreed that the day was to be a universal church observance. The term Halloween comes from All Hallows Eve. So they compromised early on. Rather than standing in opposition to this culture that was clearly pagan and demonic in nature, they attempted to appease the inhabitants of that region when they went there. They allowed that aspect of the culture to remain. Rather than being transformed, they conformed to the image of the world that was going on in that day. And sadly, do we not do the same in so many areas of our life in Christianity today? There's a whole lot of things, not just Halloween, where we as Christians transform to the image of the world rather than transforming the world to what Christ has to say in Scripture. How far have we taken this very theory? Where do 90% of the pumpkins that are sold come from today? You buy them at churches, do you not, right? How insane is that? Knowing the origin of the day, knowing that these were objects of worship, doesn't the scripture teach us that we shouldn't be messing with idols? They were, we as Christians, our churches are going and selling the stuff that gets up carved up that in effect is repeating that act of idolatry and worship unto Satan from back in the day. How crazy are we as believers in Jesus Christ, right? Think about that for a moment. This is how deep that rabbit trail goes in so many areas of our life. Our founding fathers actually knew this. It says that in America in the early days, they refused to permit the holiday to be observed because they knew it was a pagan holiday. Our forefathers actually rejected it. They knew that it was pagan. They said, this this can't stand. This can't happen. We're not going to celebrate this holiday when they formed our nation. It was not widely celebrated into the United States until 1900. In the 1840s, there was a terrible potato famine in Ireland, which sent thousands of Catholics, Irish, Catholic Irish to America. They brought Halloween with them. The modern custom of going door to door asking for food and candy goes back to the time of the Druids. They believe that sinful lost souls were released upon the earth by Sam Han for one night on October 31st while they awaited their judgment. They were thought to throng about the houses and living were greeted with banquet-laden tables. People greatly feared these spirits and thought that the spirits would harm and even kill them if the sacrifices they gave did not appease Simhan. They carved demonic faces into pumpkins or large turnips, placing a candle in them to keep the evil spirits away from their homes as we shared a little bit earlier. Now, what's another thing they do? One of the big traditions of Halloween is costumes, right? 
Everybody gets decorated in costumes, sometimes evil costumes, sometimes very good angelic costumes. Do you know where that started in the same day? Because what they believed is that these demonic spirits were coming to kill them. So people attempted to disguise themselves with the hope that they wouldn't be seen or recognized by that particular demon. So if my daughter Molly is being really good and I know those demons are not coming to get her, I'm going to dress up like Molly on Halloween, right? Or they dress up really evil-like so that hopefully they're more evil than that demon and that demon doesn't see them for who they are, right? This was the logic that went into it. Yeah, we go out there, let's go get our angel costume on. Come on, let's go do it. We're actually repeating exactly what they were doing back then. We're in effect going through the same ritualistic acts And the devil wants to continue to convince us that everything's okay, that there's no problem, that there's no challenge with this. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just a fun day. Nothing bad is going on. Well, in fact, Satan worshipers today, it is still their high holy holiday, and they still sacrifice children unto the devil right here, even in America. It happens right here, right now, today. Why even dabble with this stuff? Come on, Jesus, right? So what part of any of that I've read so far sounds remotely Christian in nature? Have I had anything yet? I mean, nothing? What part of it sounds like something that Christians should be celebrating? Is anything I've said so far sound redeeming so far? No? So let's continue on with our examination by looking at the cultural context. Halloween in America in 2014 is one of the most celebrated holidays of all the year. Christians participate in it in nearly as much as any other group of people. Parents dress their little darlings in princess and cowboy costumes, knock on doors for candy, and decorate the inside and outside of their houses with festive jack-o'-lanterns, hanging ghosts, adorable witches, and warlocks. So we know that Christians today celebrate this holiday just as much as any non-Christian, but again, I raise that question, should we? The aisles of Walmart are filled with Halloween stuff, are they not? You go through there today, it's packed out. Pop-up stores pop up for a month and make enough money for the whole year on this particular day, then discount very aggressively at the conclusion of it, so they're open for like maybe two or three months and make enough money for the entire year. So there's obviously a huge market for this kind of stuff. Some people go crazy for it. How many of you people have one of those people on your block? Some of you? Some of you are that person. Come on, Jesus. It's okay. It's all good. They go crazy for it. I saw a picture. I think I posted on Facebook. Like they literally had an entire spider that overtook the entire house and webs. I mean, they just go absolutely nuts. Just like Mary Jo used to do when we were coming up. That was what we used to do. I'm in trouble now. (laughs) They decorate their house more than Christians do on Christmas, right? Entire theme parks are dedicated to it, like Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights. Entire theme parks transform into it for a season. On Halloween itself, it seems like everyone dresses up and participates. In fact, dare I say, there's even a pressure to conform. It is expected that you would do it. If you don't, you are a weird person, right? You're, you're the weird one. You're the peculiar person. May we be a peculiar people in our day and age. My daughter shared a story with me, Miranda. I saw her in here somewhere. She might have slipped out. But Miranda is a hairdresser, and they were getting ready and talking about what all the hairdressers were going to be wearing for Halloween as they're cutting your hair that particular day. Um, And Miranda said, you know, hey, I, I don't celebrate Halloween. They got angry, even hostile with her. Our grandchild is named Oliver Wolf Wilkins, and her boss went and bought him a wolf costume that she was going to give him as a gift. She said, I went out there and spent money on a wolf costume. How dare you not celebrate Halloween? He was angry and upset, and I've had Christians get angry and upset with me when I say that this isn't the holiday that maybe we should be participating in. Maybe it's not a holiday that we should be sharing in. People get violent about this matter, right? They're so passionate about it. In fact, one guy after the service, this past service, came up and said, you know, I heard the message in previous years where you started to talk about this a little bit. I know you didn't go into the detail you did, but I rebelled against 
against it. And I, I just, I couldn't receive it at that time. And today the Lord began to change his heart where he saw it with a different light. And he said, I'm going home and getting everything out of the house. And I pray some others may do the same because I don't think this is a holiday that any of us should be participating in. In fact, I think we should all be aliens, outsiders, outcasts as it pertains to this particular subject. Can I get an amen? amen. Romans 12:1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By testing, you may discern that which is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what does that verse tell us to do? It says that we should test the spirits, to discern what is good and evil. And it says that we should not be conformed to the image of the world. How many times does that get us in trouble? When is the time that you get yourself in trouble? When you conform to the image of the world, when you do the things that the world does is when we find ourselves in places of darkness, when we find ourselves at places we shouldn't be or shouldn't go, he's saying you shouldn't participate in those things. Allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One author writes it this way. When we, the Christians, participate in Halloween, we're continuing the Jewish, or not Jewish tradition, the J Druid tradition that was begun in human sacrifices and worship of the gods of the underworld. The Bible tells us not merely to avoid evil, but to also avoid anything that might appear evil. We are called to be salt and light to a lost and dying world. We're called to be a peculiar people, visibly different than the world around us. Participating in the devil's holiday is at the very least a bad testimony, and it sends confusing messages to our children. Isn't that how the devil works in and through trying to corrupt the minds of our children? I'll give you a few more examples of that before we close today. See, I would also add to that participating in, dabbling in, Halloween, Harry Potter, dare I say it in Jesus' name, horror movies, fortune telling, even a little bit can open doorways to the occult that you may never be able to shut. You let a little bit in and then all of a sudden the whole gets corrupted, right? I'm not just talking about Halloween here. I can remember a story, not a story, I can remember my life. Give you an example of letting a little bit in that allowed demonic activity into me that controlled me for over 13 years. So at the age of 10, my brother had this brilliant idea. My brother um, was into using drugs. He was into smoking pot. He was into drinking and he was into partying. He was in high school. I was only 10 years old. So his concept when he had to babysit me one night was he didn't want to babysit me in the first place, right? But he had to babysit me while my parents were out. So he wanted to party with his friends. So he had this brilliant idea that he would make me or force me to smoke pot so that he would use upon me. This is the words that he told me. He said, see, you're smoking pot because if you do, then you can't tell on me that I did because that way I'm going to tell them that you smoke pot too and you got in trouble. So in the mind of a 10 year old, I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> you know, I can't do this. But here's the more important part. I can still remember that very first hit at age 10. I remember it because very distinctly, I remember that demon coming into me where it felt like forks were going down the back of my throat and coming in to take possession of me. I remember it. It didn't take root until about three years later, teenagers who are still in this room today. You see, three years later at a Halloween, not at a Halloween party, but at a party, there was a girl named Louise Erskine who I really thought I loved at that time, as 13-year-olds do, and there were older people at the party, and everybody was smoking pot at the party, and I thought the way into her heart was to smoke pot out there with those people so that I could be in and that I could fit in. Now, one cool part of the story, Louise went on and is now a youth pastor. Come on, Jesus. She's been here a number of times with her kids. She's down in South Florida, and God redeemed her story too, which is just a beautiful thing. But that day I went out there and I smoked pot that first time of my own volition, not of being forced to do it. And of my own volition, I partake it. And then that demon just activated in my heart. 
Every day for the next 13 years, until I was 26 years old, I had to be high on some substance. I had to be high on alcohol, pot, pills, cocaine, you name it. I had to be doing something or I didn't feel normal because that demon had taken possession of my heart. That demon of addiction got inside of me. So if you dabble even a little bit in any of these things of the occult and allow them into your life, you don't know what door you're opening. It could corrupt everything about your life and lead you down a 13-year or lifelong rabbit trail of which you can never recover. That brings me maybe to our sermon illustration for today. I was blessed to give you all some of those brownies. Hopefully you guys enjoy some of those brownies. Come on, Jesus, right? Let me give you the backstory of how we made them. Hey, Journey Church, I wanted to give you the story behind the brownies that you received as you came into church today. You know, everybody who's been around Journey any length of time knows that brownies are absolutely my favorite dessert. So I thought this particular Halloween, I'd give a treat to everybody who's coming to our house. Rather than giving candy, I'm going to go ahead and give them brownies. So I thought I'd give them to you guys in advance. I wanted to make sure that they were farm fresh, so I went out into our farm, and I got some eggs that we're going to be using in it. I've got our cows here and we're going to be milking those so we could give some fresh milk to everybody who comes up. Now the Bible does say that a little leaven will mess up the entire batch. So this time maybe I could do a little bit of a trick rather than a treat for people. So I'm going to do my special cow fudge brownie. So I don't think anybody's going to mind this, right? So um, I get a little bit of this as my special fudge ingredient here. You see that there? But you know what? Maybe if I put this much in the batch, everybody's going to know. The brownies are going to kind of stink a little bit. The trick might not go over that good. So why don't I just do this? I'll get a little bit of my very special fudge ingredient. Thanks to our buddies right over here, number 20, number 11. These guys are really helping me out here. I'm going to get just a little bit of this fudge and put it in the brownies. I don't think anybody will mind. I hope you enjoyed the brownies as you came in. Trick or treat. Those are from Sam's. It's all oh good. Oh, no, he didn't, you know. You're safe. It's all good. But hopefully that illustration made the point, however poor the quality of the video ended up being, hopefully you still got the point that you let a little bit in and it could really mess you up, right? It's not something that we should do. It's not something that we should allow into our life. We should be a set apart people. We should use this day as an opportunity to create conversation. So you don't need to answer people weird. Like if they say, are you participating in this day? You say, you know, no, as as a believer in Jesus Christ, it's just not a day that I participate in the origins of it. We're not Christian in nature and you don't have to share it in some crazy way that freaks people out, but you will be peculiar. You will stand out as a person who doesn't participate in this day. And it might give you an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with them of why you believe what you believe and use it as an evangelistic opportunity. Or maybe you're saying, what do I replace it with, right? What do I do instead for my kids? Well, one, you got to educate your kids on this particular matter that mommy and daddy do not participate in things that have a demonic root or demonic nature. It's not something that we're going to do in our family, in our life. And we want to protect you from that. In fact, there were many days where our kids didn't go to uh, school on the Halloween day. That was just something we abstained from because our kids were in public school. We kept them home with us on that particular day, knowing what they were going to experience on that worldly holiday. It was something we didn't do. So there's a couple of our small groups that are the iMarriage groups. They're all getting together off of 220 down there, and they're going to have a costume-less party. They're going to have a good time that night. They're going to hang out. So if you're looking for a place to go, parents that you can participate in, many of them are gathering together to just have a fun alternative to Halloween that night. They're going to give away candy. They're going to have a great time and still enjoy that evening without the trappings of the holiday that uh, or we're trying to reject here through scripture. And uh, at some point in the future, I pray that again, Journey Church will have a huge Halloween alternative at some point like we did back in the day where no kid would ever want to participate in what the world has to say for Halloween. Can I get an amen to that? Come on, Jesus. Another argument that I often hear and would like to dispel today would be um, that 
people say, well, what about Christmas and what about, there's, there's 50 what abouts, you know, there's what about Walking Dead, what about this, what about that, but let's focus on Christmas and let's focus on Easter for a moment. Um, those holidays were originally Christian, do we realize that? Christmas is not about Santa Claus at its root. Christmas is about Jesus Christ being born in a manger, right? Easter is not about the Easter bunny. Easter is about Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead, right? These are the devil's attempts to steal glory from God. He wants to steal glory. He wants to turn Christmas into Santa Claus. So get this. Remember, I put a T for teen disclaimer, so you've got to forgive me if, if I say something and you have a conversation with your kids afterwards if you left them in here. But, so they get us to lie to our, the devil gets us to lie to our children about him, right? So we go out there and we tell our children this lie that he's the one. And then you hear the language about Santa where it's like, he, he knows when you've been naughty or nice. He knows when you've been good or bad, right? He's taking on the attributes of God, right? And then the devil deceives us into lying to our children. And then there comes a day where you kind of have to have a conversation that maybe he's not who he says he was, right? And then it puts this seed of doubt in the heart of our children that now we, they don't want to believe in God because mommy and daddy lied to me about that. I remember that. I don't know if you remember. It was a traumatic experience and I wasn't even a believer. I remember I was driving on the Palmetto Expressway with my mom in South Florida. That's a danger in and of itself if you live down in South Florida. Uh, we were, I wasn't driving. That would have been really scary. But I, I don't remember the exact age, but I remember that day. I was like weeping. No! And the tooth fairy's not real either? Oh my God. But think about that at a root level. The devil gets you to lie to your kids and Christians. You do it. So what about Easter eggs? Do you know what that is? Easter eggs are to the God of fertility that you're worshiping. And we go out there and we run around and grab it and everything's fine. Everything's dandy. So what is the difference between the two? We need to redeem the Christian holidays. We need to remind people that it is not about Santa Claus, that it is not about the Easter bunny, that it is about Jesus Christ came and was born in a manger, lived a perfect life, died on a a sinner's death on the cross, but rose again that we might have life. That's what those holidays are about. They are more than worth redeeming. A holiday that has no Christian nature whatsoever has no ability to redeem because it wasn't Christian in the first place. It was evil in the first place. As you're going to see through scripture, the Bible says those kinds of things you destroy utterly and completely because if you don't, they will come back to bite you. You avoid them. You don't participate in them. There's nothing to redeem. You could go ahead and say, I'll wear all the good fun suits and everything's fun and dandy. That's exactly what the Druids did. They wore the nice stuff to disguise themselves from the evil spirits. It's not worth redeeming. Do you understand why I state the difference? Does that make sense to you today? It's an occult holiday, Satan's high holiday, and it remains so. Let me give you a quote. I read a great one. A lie doesn't become the truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by the majority. Think about that again for a minute. Powerful thought. A lie does not become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil does not become good just because it is accepted by the majority. All right, let's get into our scriptural arguments. Deuteronomy 18, 9. When you come into the land that your Lord God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of these nations. There shall be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter on as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. So he says, get them out, clear them out. What was the problem? The Jewish people didn't get them out. And then many of those practices ended up creeping back into their life and caused them a great deal of stress. Ultimately so that in Isaiah, they found themselves at the same place where America's at today, where they were willing to sacrifice their children unto other gods. So where does that start? Culture tells us 
Sex sells. Have sex. Do whatever you want. Last service, all the youth were in one corner. Today, I got to look around because it applies to us adults too. Sex is bad out of the context of marriage, right? It might seem fun. It might be pleasurable. It might be enjoyable. But what is the fruit of one person having sex with another? Typically, what is the consummation of that? A child. Some of you have those back there in kids' church, right? So what happens when we take it out of God's will and God's context, right? So we commit the sin of worshiping the God of sex, and we end up having sex one to another, as was what happened with Mary Jo and I when we were 17, and we're doing things out of God's decency and order, and then we found ourselves at a place where at the age of 18, we were babies having babies, and it wasn't easy, right? But more often than not, sadly, The fruit of that is an abortion. So what happens is we commit one act of sexual intercourse outside of the context of marriage and we end up sinning in that. And then to conceal our sin, we're willing to sacrifice our children on the altar of convenience to a God, which is not the God of the universe, the God Molech. We don't call it that today, but we certainly do the exact same thing those pagans did, Christians and unchristians alike, do we not? Is there hope for someone who's committed abortion? Yes, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, just as there's hope for any other sin. We're not elevating one sin above any other sin here in this place. There is hope and forgiveness that's found in Jesus. If you're struggling in that area of your life, talk to us. We'd love to help you. We'd love to tell you about how good God is, that he forgives, that he loves, that he sets free, that you can use that as a testimony to change other lives so that other people don't have to make that same decision. But he's saying when you let that little bit in, It's okay, we're just going to mess around as teenagers. There's eternal consequences that start to come out as a result that extend far beyond Halloween, if I'm being clear, right? Does everybody get what I'm saying here today? So embedded in our society are these concepts that we accept them as okay. We had a conversation in our house the other day. There's a show that seems all cute and wonderful on the surface. Our granddaughter loves it. Sophia the First. I've heard the jingle so many times. How many of you know who Sophia the First is? A lot of y'all know who Sophia is. You know that in that show, it's all about witchcraft. It's all about wizardry. It's all about sowing into the mind of a two-year-old that witchcraft is okay, that spells are okay, that this kind of lifestyle is okay, so that when they get older and they're dealing with other things that have even deeper significance, that all of a sudden these sinful things are absolutely 100% okay. Yet when we look at scripture, what did it say? When you see any hint of any of those things, you're supposed to destroy it and flee from it and not be anywhere near it. You're not supposed to participate in it, but they'll sow it in a nice way into the life of your two-year-old through Sophia the First. What book has been out there other than the Bible that has influenced more people to read than any other book in our generation? Harry Potter. Potter. Oh, Harry Potter's not, I got, I got almost in a fight with somebody up here about a year and a half ago when, when I said Harry Potter, you know, you probably shouldn't participate in that. Here's why. Here's the strongholds that come up. These people were Christians. They love God, but they missed this particular point. They were actually running a Harry Potter club at their school, teaching people how to read because it got kids interested in reading, right? But what they're teaching them at the same time is that spells and incantations and wizardry and all these things that stand in opposition to God's word are absolutely wonderfully okay. So what happens when your teenager hits Leo and all these things are in their mind and everything is okay? The reprogramming opportunity is a very difficult one. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because the devil has a plan. Do you have a plan, parent? Or are you just going to flow into what the culture has for your kid? Do you have a plan to prevent them from those things, to protect them from those things and advance the kingdom of God in their life? If you don't, I assure you the devil does. He's going to teach them stuff for you. If you don't, let's not confuse our kids. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil and hold fast to that which is good. Sadly, in modern day Christianity, there's not a whole lot of abhorring what is evil. Where's the outcry against any of these subjects anymore? Sadly, it comes from the fringe of Christianity that looks like crazy people and probably are. But what about us mainstream Christians who might live differently in light of all that we know? What an influence we might have on the community around us. 
focus on what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. Abstain. How many of you like that word? I don't like that word. Abstain from food so that you can have a six pack. How many of us succeeded at that one, right? It didn't work out too good, right? How about um, abstain from sex, what I talked about a little bit earlier. Got us in a little bit of trouble for some of us who are in this room, right? How about abstain from drugs, just say no. That worked, didn't it? Didn't work out too good, right? As Christians, even, we have trouble with that word abstain. We don't like it. In our sinful nature, it rubs us wrong. We don't want to abstain from it because it feels good to do these things, but ultimately the devil always bites us on the back end, does he not? We need to learn to have the discipline to abstain from, which means to not participate in. So what does that mean with regards to Halloween? If it has evil origins, should we abstain from it or should we continue to flow in it? Just a couple more verses before we go. Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice unto God. Leads us to Ephesians 5, 8. It's one of the most important ones of our whole day for me. For at one time you were in darkness but now you are the light of the world. At one time, before you were a believer in Jesus Christ, you were in darkness. Now you are the light. At one time, before you knew all of this, your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding was in darkness. Now it has been illuminated in your your life. Walk as children of the light. Fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing unto the Lord. And here's the last statement. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, as we're doing today. Take no part in them. Where did we not get this right as Christians? Holiness, sanctification, it matters. God calls us to live as a different and peculiar people. Ephesians 5, 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are what? Evil. Do you sense it? We live in evil days. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. My final verse for today, Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He has a scheme for each one of us. He has a scheme for our kids. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly places. Whether or not you are willing to admit it or not, you are in a world at war and there is a target on your back if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. The devil is trying to take you out. God is saying, stand firm. Put on the entire armor of God. Walk in faith. Walk in might. What he's not saying is don't go hang out and party in the enemy camp. Take a moment for that one to sink in. Halloween is taking a night to go party and hang out in the enemy camp. God is saying to us today, choose this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the Lord God who died for you on a cross, who loves you and cares for you, or are you going to continue to dabble in these things that are evil? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, I pray that nobody takes offense at me, but rather at your word and at scripture. I pray that no hearts are hardened in this place today, but that you would stir something in our hearts that you would cause us to be a unique and peculiar people who would be lights in this world, who would be salt in this world, who would make a difference in every area of our lives and use this as an opportunity to share the gospel through our differences. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you want to do today in and through this message and the people who hear it. Lord, if people are on the edge, if they're on the fence, I encourage them to do research on their own, that they would continue to grow and learn and gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that they would not take offense at you, but they would rather desire to please you in all that they do. Would it extend beyond Halloween, Lord God, into every area of our life? I ask you today, Christian, what other things are you letting into your life that are keeping you from being a fully devoted follower of Jesus? Are you like me and you're struggling in some area of addiction? 
God can set you free. Are you in a relationship you're not supposed to be in? Has pride gotten root in your heart? What areas of your life need to be rooted out because their root is evil and not good? The Holy Spirit says he'll meet you in this place. You no longer have to struggle. You can be freed from those things. They no longer have to be a battle in your life. So I ask you today, if you're here, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You love him with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, but you're really struggling either with my message today or with some other area of your life. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand up real high? A lot of people with struggles in this place. Maybe for some of you, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. You wouldn't call yourself a Christ follower, but today, having heard this message, you understand the reality of good and evil. You see that Satan is a schemer, a liar, a deceiver, and he's attempted to keep you in darkness, but The light of the Lord has shone on your heart today and you have a desire just burning in your heart to become a follower of Jesus. You want to live for him and serve him all the days of your life. If that's you, I want to pray for you too. If that's you, would you do me a favor and raise your hand up real high? I'll pray for you. I see you, sir. And you, ma'am. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you that you still hold the power to touch and change lives as you've already done as many people have raised their hand today. Father, may we have the courage to live differently knowing that you came and died in our place for our sins that we might have life. One day for the majority of us who are in this room, we said, Jesus, we make you Lord of our life. Father, forget us for the many moments where we've attempted to take back the reins, where we've attempted to drive into places where you would not have us go. Lord, we thank you that your blood brings forgiveness of all sins and remission of them, that we are welcomed into the family of God and the household of God, and by your stripes we are healed, that you give us the power to be changed, the power to transform, the power to overcome the spiritual forces of wickedness and heavenly places that are attempting to keep us down, giving us the power even to help us in our own decision-making by renewing our mind. So, Lord, I do come against the forces of wickedness in heavenly places right now, and I bind them and I cast them out far from the people of Journey Church. May they have no right or authority over the people of Journey Church. No wicked or foul spirit could attempt to destroy a marriage or cause someone to be addicted or the variety of different schemes of the devil. Lord, we reveal the schemes of the devil right now, the attacks, the methods, the methodology, and make it plain and simple for all of us to see, Lord God. Would you reveal those things so that we could thwart them in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus as we take up the armor of God today and we leave this place would we walk out the might the power the authority of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings see no foul thing can stand in opposition to the name of Jesus Christ he is our King he is our Lord it is the name above every other name and Lord would that name be present in abundance throughout the people of Journey Church as we go out there from this place today to live as salt and light in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us today.